It is now my great privilege to introduce our guest of honor, Senior Minister Lee Kuan Yew. Senior Minister, you've been an inspiration to us. By making the world a richer place, by fiercely preaching and practicing racial harmony, honesty and integrity. Your strong belief in the excellence of education and the value of a knowledge-based community will remain a beacon for those of us who are training the leaders of tomorrow. Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, please. Chairman of the Council, <coughs> Rector of the Imperial College, my lords, ladies and gentlemen. I often listen to the BBC World Service program as a matter of habit from my student days in Britain. And one service program recently was on how the monarchy and the British people have changed in the 50 years of Queen Elizabeth II's reign. <clears throat> it put me into a reflective mood. And I thought of the Britain I knew as a student after the war in 1946 and the profound changes that have occurred in the last 55 years. I first came to London early in October of 1946. I arrived by ship at Liverpool and took a train to Euston Station. It was an inauspicious arrival. <laughs> there was no one to meet me at Liverpool docks because no one knew I was coming. I had contrived a passage on a troop ship the Cunard Liner, the Britannic, which was taking British troops home from Singapore for demobilization. I had written to London to get myself admitted to the Middle Temple. On the strength of that admission, by letter, I persuaded a kind-hearted officer in charge of military transport to make an exception and allow me to join the troops. Fortunately, there were a few Hong Kong students on board and arrangements had been made for them and they were met by some officials from the welfare section of the colonial office. I hitched a ride. From Houston, we were taken to a Victoria League hostel down in Earl's Court. I remember a huge cavernous basement dormitory with double-decker bucks. There, I met, for the first time, fellow colonial students from faraway places, British subjects like myself, but from faraway places like Africa, the Caribbean, and many other parts of the world. Their strangeness added to my disorientation. I was determined to get away and get more privacy as soon as I could. Some three days later, I persuaded a secretary at the YMCA in Great Russell Street, near the Tottenham Court Road's tube station, to take pity on a young Chinaman who appeared lost and bewildered. He gave me a room for three days. The maximum limit, he explained, allowed to visitors in London. Every three days I turned up with my hard luck story of the last three days and got my stay extended. <laughs> at the end of the twelfth day, I found a room at Fitzjohn's Avenue, Swiss Cottage, then a quiet suburb. I wrote to the law faculty of the LSE and was interviewed by a Professor Hughes Parry, the head of the faculty later Vice-Chancellor of London University. And he admitted me as a student even though I was a few weeks late after the academic year had started. But I was ill-prepared for the hectic life 
in a university sited in the capital city like London. Lectures would begin at the LSE in Houghton Street. We would then have to dash across the Strand to King's College for the second lecture, then a bus ride to Houston for the third at University College, followed by a cafeteria lunch, then back to the LSE by bus or tube, either for tutorials or work in the library. By the time I got back to my rooms at St. John's, Fitz John's Avenue in the evening, I was exhausted and depressed. For one from a small town where the bicycle took me wherever I needed to go, my life in London was one of total disorientation. Furthermore, I did not have the necessary survival skills. The book Cooking in a Bed Sitter was yet to be published. I can assure you that without these basic skills, life was inconvenient, uncomfortable and expensive. Eating was a drudgery, eating out a dreary experience. Food was on coupons, so were clothes. When my laundry came back, I calculated to my dismay that for six washings I could buy a new shirt provided I had the coupons. And a shirt got grimy at the collar and cuffs in half a day's suit-laden London. It was a different age and a different generation. After six exhausting years of bombings and privation, Londoners in the 1940s took great pride in themselves. They were courteous, and discipline. Bomb sites were cleared, the bricks neatly piled to one side, and little makeshift gardens created. Perhaps the most impressive sight I came upon was when I emerged from the tube station at Piccadilly Circus. I found a little table with a pile of newspapers and a box of coins and notes. With nobody in attendance, you take your newspaper, toss your coin into the box, or put your ten shilling note and take your change. I took a deep breath. This was truly a civilized people. After three months in London, I abandoned life in a bedsitter for the University town of Cambridge where survival skills were not so necessary. <laughs> because the university, which catered for 10,000 gentlemen and a few young ladies, assumed that they did not have such menial skills and so were prepared to administer to their needs. That Britons today are better off materially than they were is visible everywhere. But that quiet pride and self-confidence that national cohesiveness that marked out the British people after victory in World War II, that has dissipated. Many of my British contemporaries believe that the loss of empire caused, caused that loss of Elan. The mirage of a Commonwealth unity beguiled the British people from facing up to the hard reality that Britain was no longer the heart of empire. Looking back at those early years, I am amazed at my youthful innocence. I watched Britain at the beginning of a great experiment with a welfare state. The Adley government started to build a society that attempted to look after its citizens from cradle to grave. I was so impressed after the introduction of the National Health Service. When I went to collect my new pair of glasses from my opticians in Cambridge, I was told that there was no payment. None was due. All I had to do was to sign a form. What a civilized society, I thought to myself. The same thing happened with the dentist and the doctor. I did not understand what a cosseted life would do to the spirit of enterprise of a people. 
diminishing their desire to achieve, to excel, and to succeed. I believe then that wealth came naturally from wheat growing in the fields, orchards bearing fruit every summer, and factories turning out all that was needed to maintain a comfortable life. Only two decades later, when I had to make an outdated entrepreneur economy feed the people, did I realize that people needed to create the wealth before we could share it. And to create wealth, high motivation, incentives are crucial to drive a people to achieve, to take risks for profits, or there would be nothing to share. I think it is remarkable that powerful minds like beverages, who thought out this egalitarian welfare system, did not foresee the unintended consequences. It took more than three decades of gradual decline before Margaret Thatcher set out to reverse it, to restore individual incentives and the motivation to succeed, to encourage risk-taking necessary for a successful entrepreneurial economy. In the five decades since I first came to London, so much has changed. I remember enough of the past to regret the passing of that age when power and influence made London throb and hum and count for much more in the affairs of the world. Five decades ago, London was a grimy, sooty, bomb-scarred city with less food, less cars, and deprived of the conveniences of the consumer society. But the people were homogeneous, white, Christians, admirable, self-confident, courteous. From that well-mannered Britain to the yobs and football hooligans of the 1990s took only 40 years. I learned that civilized living does not come about naturally. There have been other significant changes. Britain is now multiracial, multilingual, multireligious. Churches are nearly empty on Sundays, with many deconsecrated and converted into places of entertainment, while some 500 mosques are filled to capacity on Fridays, the Muslim Sabbath. And so also are many Hindu temples and places of worship of other religions. Well, what of the future? I could not foresee my own country's fate. In January 1968, when the British government announced their withdrawal from the east of Suez, which included Singapore, I feared that the curtains would come down on us. I read with unease several scholarly analysis in British weeklies comparing it to the withdrawal of the Roman legions from Britain. It was a most ominous analogy. It conjured up visions of loss of civic order, of anarchy and barbarity in its place. Fortunately, the past has not been an accurate pointer to the future. Today, there are more Britons toing and froing between Britain and Singapore than ever since. And there are more British merchants, industrialists, bankers, professionals than ever in Singapore, making a great contribution to our economy. Technological breakthroughs have made historical analogies misleading. Many confid confidently predicted that the end of the Cold War would bring stability and growth and the peace dividend. Instead, the world is beset with new dangers, not least of them from fanatical Muslim terrorists. All the power and might of the United States might not be able to completely suppress a religiously driven terrorist. 
and America fearful of weapons of mass destruction in the hands of Saddam Hussein. Technology has brought different races with divergent religions and cultures into constant interaction and with sometimes unexpected and unhappy outcomes. However, breakthroughs in science and technology, especially in the life sciences, promise mankind longer, healthier and more fulfilling lives. And it is the young across the world who will be the major beneficiaries of these discoveries. But they will have to manage the problems that come with rapid changes in the way they live, work and interact with each other in an ever smaller world or there will be more strife and conflict. Thank you.